Pat and I have had one service in person at Oak Lake God, and you know, after months of recording services, you forget things, you get a little rusty, so be generous, forgive us if we make some strange errors, which probably won't happen. But uh, nonetheless, it is a joy. And you know, part of the joy is seeing you here and recognizing there are others who will watch the service later today and who opted to stay home. The goal is to keep you safe, feeling safe. And so for those who are at home and watching this, you are as much a part of the service as those who are here. Um, remember, as I've said every week uh, during those months that were fully remote, that there are others in need. The economy's coming back, but for some people it's still hard. So remember those uh, who are in need. These are gorgeous flowers today, and we'll be talking about them a little bit more a little bit later. Next Sunday, uh, which is Mother's Day, we have a gap. We don't have anybody who's claimed the flowers to dedicate them or do them in honor of somebody. If you'd like to do so, just call the office this week and Sandy will take care of that for you. Uh, a couple of other uh, notices coming up. Uh, next Sunday, after the service, there will be a very brief session trustee meeting. We did not have our joint meeting in uh, April, and uh, we, are, we are supposed to, and if we don't, then the Presbytery will close the church. So uh, I, that's an exaggeration. Uh, nonetheless, we will have a very brief uh, meeting at, right after the service for the session and the trustees. The annual meeting is two weeks uh, from this Sunday, on the 16th, after the service here, the second service. We will have our annual meeting when we will review the reports from last year. The upper rooms, thank you, Carol Shearer. <laughs> had them over sitting, waiting to be brought over for this service, and Carol looked at me with this, where are the upper rooms? So I, Got a little, I got a few more steps, and I went home. The upper rooms are right behind Mike. He's guarding them. If you would like them afterwards, they are there. So are updated phone lists and newsletters, in case you would like to look at the newsletter. I don't think you've probably received it in the mail, and if you'd like to take a quick peek, uh, you can get one back there. And those are all the announcements I have. And as I did the first time, I kind of forgot to do this. Are there any other announcements? Seeing none, let us begin our worship together.
Again, good morning. Let us pray. Dear God, this is the fifth Sunday of Easter. Help us to keep our eyes on Easter. Help us to learn what Jesus taught in the days of that most holy week. All this we ask in his name, he who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. And now, as printed in your bulletin, we will turn to hymn 366, one of my favorites, Love Divine, All Loves Excel It.
Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in things we thought, things we've said, things we've done, things we've left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We most certainly have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Oh, in your mercy, forgive what we've been. Change what we are. Direct what we shall be so that we may walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Sadly, it is human to be afraid. There's just too much hurt. We're just too aware of our failings. And yet, God loves us even with our flaws. God wills us to heal past all hurt given and received. And this is why I can say to you this day, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Trust God, trust God's love, and then dare to love. Let us now come before the Lord with the joys and the concerns that are on our hearts this morning. And for the first time in several months, I can ask, does anybody have any joys or concerns that you would care to lift up at this time? Yes. Um, our cousin Barbara Brackville is in the hospital with uh, blood clot in her lung. 
she's been having kind of a rough time. So. Thank you. We will pray for Barbara. <clears throat> in case you didn't hear, Barbara Bradfield has a clot in her lung. We want to pray for her. Are there others? Yes. Well, it's a joy to worship here again, finally. But I can't be saved. Because it's dangerous. Express our joy. Betty, it's dangerous. I checked with. Don't be afraid. Oh, I'm not afraid. Trust me, I'm not afraid. But I am concerned about keeping others safe. I'm not afraid for myself. Are there other joys or concerns? Yes. The restrictions on our son Bill has been lifted and you're allowed to visit him now. Yes. Well, not only are you allowed to visit with Bill, but you're allowed to take him out to dinner. I don't see that right, but that's the word. You told me you could take him out. I don't see that right. All right. Never mind. They can visit him, but they can't take him out. But whatever. All right. That's great. And hopefully it's in right. Are there any others? I have quite a few. Uh, first of all, it is, you're right, Betty, a joy to be regathered, but I want you all to, again, be mindful that there are people who have chosen to remain safe for a variety of good reasons, and they will watch this service later today uh, on our website. And at the risk of embarrassing him, I want to give a special thanks to Mike Hartman, who has made some incredible services filmed over these many months. <laughs> Does that mean you're never coming again? <laughs> I hope not. Uh, so anyway, yes, and, and, and to, to Betty's point, uh, we ask for people to let us know, if, anonymously if you will, if you've been vaccinated. Uh, we know that's a privacy issue, and somebody gave me an idea yesterday of just putting a uh, basket or something in the back, and you can have yes or no and check it off, and you don't have to sign it. If we can get to the point where we know that 90% or whatever of the congregation is vaccinated, then we can look at things like singing and all the rest of it. But until we do, we have a greater responsibility to care for each other. It's not about ourselves, it's about each other. Uh, Don and B. Andrews are our prayer people this week. And I wanted to share with you a little of what B. shared with me. She wanted me emphatically, as a matter of fact, she mentioned this several times, to thank all of you who have been sending cards. And it was remarkable that sometimes those cards came right when they were most needed. So, all kudos to you. She said that Don and she have pretty good health. Though the family has challenges. And uh, this part, these next two things she said I thought were great. They are plugging away, living and doing, and they're not going to give in to age or anything else. So uh, that's good. And finally, this is like something I could almost use as a topic for a sermon. She said she believes that COVID-19 has taught the need for kindness of heart, the need to value even the little things more. Thank you. That was great. These beautiful flowers <coughs> are in memory of Jim Hass and Pat I, given by Jerry, and let's celebrate the life of Jim and Pat. Um, we, uh, I agree that it's a joy to regather as we regather safely. Diane mentioned something in the first service I haven't even heard of. It's a wonderful thing. The Inter Intercourse Merchants Association, I gather, sponsored the prom, and the proceeds that they received, they then gave to the factory. So that's a great thing. I mean, you have a prom, and you help people at the same time. So that's good. Um, on the concern uh, side of the ledger, Ken, who is married to Janice, uh, Ken is Don and B's son-in-law, recently received a pacemaker, as those of you in the prayer chain know. 
And uh, he and Janice had to go out to Ohio because his mother had put on hospice, and I just learned before the service that Ken's mother had passed away. So we want you to lift up that family in prayers. Mary Weaver has taken a turn for the worse. She is declining. I have not heard anything I checked this morning, but uh, we want to pray for her and her family. Um, Corn. Corn was with us at the first service, and his cousin Mary uh, is having health issues, and we'd ask that you pray for Mary. Uh, you already heard about Barbara Brackbill. Bonnie Rice is doing better to the extent that in the afternoons, if you want to reach out to her, give her a call or something, that's the time to do it. She feels a lot more energy, and she's feeling pretty strong, usually in the afternoons. However, the mornings can be more of a challenge, and she needs someone to be with her on Tuesday and Friday mornings in May. And Lois, God bless her, is coordinating all that, and so if you are willing, to be with uh, Bonnie on Tuesday or Friday morning in May, just contact Lois and she's going to work out that schedule. Are there any other joys or concerns? Seeing none, let us pray. Great and gracious God, how wonderful is your love for us. It's humble. Life can be hard and it can hurt, but you, you persist in offering life, in blessing us with large and small joys, in fellowship, in ways and places that can surprise us, in raising us from our tombs. We thank you. And this day in particular, we thank you for Don and Bea, the lives of Jim and Pat, for the merchants of intercourse, for the fact that Bill can now be visited again, for this regathering, and for keeping us safe all these months, and for all else that we lift up to you now in the silence of our hearts. Caring God, you know that mortal life hurts sometimes. You see us in all the tombs we build for ourselves. Yet you seek us over and over again. You call us, as Jesus called Lazarus, to come out, to heal, to live, to love. Lord, come with healing this day especially to Ken and his family, to Mary Weaver, to Corin's cousin Mary, to Bonnie, to Barbara, and to all others whom we lift up to you now in the silence of our hearts. pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of Amen. Now another one of my favorite hymns, as it happens, hymn 692, which is an insert spirit, open my heart. <clears throat>
Our scripture reading today is taken from the first letter of John, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is perfected in us. God is love. If those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because He first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from Him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. The Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. It's probably a good idea to so often to reflect on well, you're all here. Why? Why do you come? Why do people come to a worship service? Presumably, we're here to express something of our faith because we believe that gathering together in worship is a part, an essential part of our religion. But what is the goal? What is the end? What is the purpose of our faith, of our religion? Well, presumably, presumably it's God. We want to worship, we come to worship God, to know and then do God's will. Okay. But look at this passage from 1 John. If God is our goal, then we must love one another. Because God is love. That's simple. And then another thing. I sometimes worry, and I've witnessed, that people come to church and practice faith because it's sort of like a merit badge system. The idea is that if you come and you pray well enough, your church every Sunday, that maybe you'll get in good with God and God, We'll prove of you. Give you a merit badge. Go pass code, go to heaven. But this passage makes it clear. God doesn't love us because we love God. Look, I highly encourage you to pray and to worship. And I highly encourage you to love the Lord. But that's not the reason God loves you. No, God loved us. Loved us first. It is not something we earn. 
All the writings that go under the name of John are called the Johannine writings. And at the heart of those writings is the power and necessity of loving. And it's not love. It's not an abstraction. It's not like, oh, we have to have love in our heart, whatever. It's that we act. We do. We're actively in the world loving. It's an action. Do you know that the word love is used only once in the letters of John and in the Gospel of John? The word loving, the verb, is used repeatedly. If we are loving, if we are actively loving, we will be born of God and we will know God. I'm sure all of you here want on some levels to know God, understand God. You cannot do that until you are a loving person, and when you do, you will know God. But if you are not loving, it is impossible to know God. If we can't, the letter says, love our sisters and brothers whom we see, you can't love God. Whom we don't see. You can't hate your sisters and brothers. You can't sit there in judgment of them, rejecting them, scoring them, and claim to love God. You must love them. And very carefully here, it's not just friends and family. It's not just those who are like us or who agree with us. Jesus made it very clear, and he, we may not like the fact he did this, but he said, look, you've got to love your enemies. It's easy to love friends and family. You've got to love your enemies. And he told this wonderful parable, the Good Samaritan. And we find out there, who are our neighbors? Who are our sisters and brothers? Everybody without exception. And again, that's the neighborly thing. The neighbor is defined by how we act, not how they earn it. And so, yeah, I preach a lot about love. Because I have to. It's at the heart of the gospel. But at the same time, I will concede that I think it's important for us to name it, because otherwise it can get rather depressing. Love is hard. It's not always easy. Maybe we'd like it to be, but it's not always easy. With apologies to John, one of the reasons that loving is hard is because I, well, I disagree with him. Sometimes when we see our sisters and brothers, it's harder to love than if we didn't see them. When we see them, we get to know them, we recognize them. Well, it's like dating. When you first start dating somebody, oh, this person's wonderful, and then you start to learn about their idiosyncrasies. And then think about being married for 50 years. But whatever. If you see your sister and brother, it can be hard. But there's another reason in this text for why loving can be hard. And I think this one gets at the real basic one. And that is fear. Fearing reveals the flaws in our love. When we're afraid, that's a dead giveaway that there's something a little off in our capacity to be a loving person. Well, think about fear. Fear comes from the anticipation of punishment. Oh, I'm not going to try that, because if I try and I don't do it, well, somebody might yell at me. And if I, if I do this, even though I think it's right, you know, people might get all upset with me. Mm, don't want that. We are afraid of judgment. We are afraid of rejection. We are afraid of betrayal. I trusted that person. They stabbed me in the back. We're afraid of denial. Think about those kids in high school. You think you're buddies with somebody, and then the, the cool kids come by, and your friend acts like they don't even know you. Punishment, judgment, rejection. Betrayal, denial. Hmm, where have I heard those before? Jesus experienced all of them on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. 
And yet he didn't fear. He knew what it felt like to be abandoned and denied, but he forgave. And because he didn't fear, he kept loving. I believe we are not born afraid. Yeah, kids are afraid if they're going to get an ouchie or whatever. Physically, yes. But I believe children are born trusting. And yet, the tragedy, I think, in many ways of human life is that all those little and big hurts start coming. And they never stop. And with them come a growing fear. I recently encountered a story that I think captures this whole tragedy of humanity and fear and broken love. It involves a girl named Olivia, not the king and Olivia. And get this. From the age of four, she was in foster care. Five homes in seven years. Think about that. Starting at four. Four to eleven. Five homes. Why were there so many foster homes? Well, Olivia learned the system. She figured out that if she didn't like her current placement, she knew how to get another one. And it seemed like a good idea. If she went to a foster home and didn't feel like she was really wanted there, well then she knew the way to leave, to get out. But the trouble is, she pretty soon concluded no one wanted her. No one could love her. Imagine, four, five, six years old, no one wants her. Hmm. So Olivia acted out in the way that kids can, endlessly testing and pushing and intentionally failing. You know, people do that. It's like being a kid in school, I, I knew one, who never studied for tests, who didn't often do the work. Why? Because if then she failed, it was on her terms, rather than trying and failing. That was too scary. But that's what happened with Olivia. If she could just act out in such a horrific way and they banished her, well, then she knew it. She caused it. It wouldn't be necessarily a rejection of her. When we're afraid, when we're afraid of being hurt, of having our heart hurt, there is a closing off. We begin to shut down. There's an inflamed vulnerability, oh, we're all vulnerable, but we become more sensitive, more sensitive. We become measured and guarded. And that's sad. And the end result of living that way is what I would call a half-life. A life of anger, weariness, division, Like life today, the life we live in, right now, in this country, in this society, in this world. This letter tells us there is no fear in love. In fact, perfect love casts out fear. And don't worry, you're not expected to have perfect love. None of us do. But that's why God, the letter says, sent God's Son. That we might live through Him. And through Him, find real, full life. A life of shalom. Which doesn't just mean peace, as I've told you many times before. It means wholeness. If we want our life to be whole, it's to live through Jesus Christ. And yet, this still remains a real challenge. And I'll tell you why. I wish I could make things simple. I wish I could give you an easy way to do this, but I can't. Because you see, full life only comes if you're willing to be hurt. Jesus himself.
himself said, those who try to save their life will lose it. And those who are willing to lose their life for my sake will find it. A willingness to dare to love. Hmm. That willingness allows us so much if we only could believe it. It means that we can be bold before God. We don't have to worry about God's judgment, even with all of our flaws. Because if we love, God embraces us despite all of those wrongs. But loving grants us so much more. It enables us to become increasingly like Christ. In all that we are and in all that we do and in the world, not within the four walls of the sanctuary, not with only our friends or in our homes. It's out there in the world with all those people who are so difficult sometimes to grasp and live with and love. But then we are imitating Christ. Then we are growing into Christ. And the love of God in Christ, this is the best thing. This gives us hope. It makes our loving possible. We can't love as well as we might alone. But God in Christ allows us to grow in our loving. And it happens. Olivia got another set of foster parents, a new foster home, the Hargis family. And the Hargis's quickly saw that Olivia really did need a home. That's not a hard one to catch. But they also figured out her pattern of testing, of rejecting, so that when her rejection came, she'd understand it. Well, the testing came, but you know what? This time it was different. They stayed. They made it clear that some of her behaviors were unacceptable, yes. But they also made it clear that neither they nor she, they weren't going anywhere. And finally, this young girl saw that they were there, and they were going to stay there. And she found trust, and she discovered that there is such a thing as two-way love. She was adopted. Her name is Olivia Hargis. And she's doing one of those things, she's now a young adult, and she's doing one of those things, I just love young adults, filled with idealism. She will tell you that she's going to change the world by revealing that love indeed, loving is possible. In verse 12 of our reading, it says that God's love is perfected. That doesn't mean it doesn't have flaws. It just means it's completed, it's most fully realized. And how is God's love perfected? Not by what God and Christ does. It's incredibly through us. It's perfected when we love one another. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's not easy. It requires risks to love. And yes, it requires a willingness to be hurt. no longer be governed by fear. What a wonderful thing. Living unafraid. Living unafraid will enable us, yes, Olivia, to change the world right along with you. Amen. All right, Betty, I'm going to do this one for you. We're going to do the Apostles' Creed, and you can gently, softly say it with me. And if you want to, no, don't say it. Uh, all right. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day, he rose again. He descend, ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. How wonderful it is today that I don't have to only say that when you are out there in the world this week, greet each other with the peace of Christ. So, very socially distanced and safe, greet each other with the peace of Christ. I tell you, that feels good. And remember, when you go out there in the world this week, in the world, be loving, even with those who are the hardest to love. Greet them with the peace of Christ. You know, this fellowship has weathered the storm of the pandemic, and you know how? Because of all of your support, whether you're here or you're at your homes, your support and the letters you've written, the calls you've made is being mentioned, and in your offering. And I can tell you, there is great gratitude for that support. And now let us turn to our final hymn, 316, where charity and love prevail to the tune of 687. Day and forevermore.